um, chapter 15, our lecture on carbohydrates. We are now going to be focusing on part two, or the second half of the chapter, in which we are going to talk about cyclic car carbohydrates, the types of reactions that carbohydrates can undergo, and the glycosidic bond to make disaccharides and polysaccharides. So in this section, um, we are going to learn how to identify Haworth projection structures for monosaccharides, identify the products of oxidation or reduction reactions for monosaccharides, and determine if a carbohydrate is a reducing sugar or not, as well as describe the monosaccharide units and linkages within disaccharides, and describe the structural features of the polymers amulose, amulopectin, glycogen, and cellulose. So let's get started. So Haworth structures um, are the cyclic representations of monosaccharides. So the most stable form of any pentose or hexose sugar is going to be a five or six atom ring. So instead of being linear in structure, often what happens is we um, undergo a reaction in which the terminal hydroxyl um, or one of the chiral hydroxyl carbons ends up bonding with our aldehyde or ketone carbonyl in the ring. So again, the Haworth structures are produced from the reaction of a carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group within the same molecule, very similar to what we were talking about when we were talking about hemiacetyl and acetyl reactions for aldehydes and ketones. So the Haworth structure of a monosaccharide is actually considered a hemiacetyl of the sugar, right? So we have the carbonyl, um, functional group and the hydroxyl coming off of the same carbon, or what was the carbonyl, but is now a reduced carbon-oxygen bond. All right, so we can look at that here. Here is glucose in its open chain structure. Um, so notice we have our aldose or our aldehyde functional group, the carbonyl at the end, um, and we have many um, hydroxyls, but we're going to focus on the carbon-5 hydroxyls. If we rotate this structure 90 degrees clockwise, then what we can see happen is C1, carbon-1, being our aldehyde carbon, is actually going to be attacked by the oxygen on carbon-5. Okay, so the carbon 5's oxygen will attack this very sort of proton rich or positively charged carbonyl carbon. Um, and when that happens, we're going to form a covalent bond between this oxygen and carbon. This hydrogen is going to be lost, um, and the um, hydrogen actually comes over to this oxygen as the carbon carbonyl oxygen bond is reduced to a single bond and that oxygen ends up coming either below the carbon or above the carbon. So we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so again, as we're sort of pushing electrons around, the hydroxyl oxygen on carbon-5 attacks the carbonyl carbon on carbon one, we end up creating a single bond between this oxygen and this carbon. That in turn is going to reduce the carbonyl double bond to a single bond. The hydrogen that was on the hydroxyl then ends up moving over to this oxygen to protonate it. Okay, so we will end up with what I hope you recognize is a hemiacetyl molecule. Okay, and this carbon right here, carbon one, is going to become what we will call our anomeric carbon or our hemiacetyl carbon. Now, the hydroxyl group has two choices. It can either come below the ring in our Fischer projection or above the ring in our Fischer projection. If it is below the ring, then we call it, call it an alpha isomer. If it's above the ring, we call it a beta isomer. 
Now this can happen with both hexoses, um, such as glucose, and even fructoses or ketohexoses. Sorry, this can happen with aldohexoses or ketohexoses. With ketohexoses, such as um, fructose, we're actually going to end up with a five-membered ring instead of the six-membered ring. Because in the fructose example, right, um, the hydroxyl from carbon five is going to attack the carbonyl on carbon two. Okay, so again, we are going to end up with still a hemiacetyl carbon or an anomeric carbon. And again, the hydroxyl orientation either below the ring or above the ring is what's going to indicate whether we have alpha fructose or beta fructose. Okay. So for example, why don't we practice writing the cyclic form of D-galactose. So get a piece of paper out and follow along with me. If you need to pause, pause. But start out drawing D-galactose, right, which is hopefully you notice an aldose, right? We have an aldehyde. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in total. Um, and again, typically the hydroxyl that is going to attack the aldehyde carbon is going to be the one furthest away um, from that aldehyde or ketone carbon. All right, so the first step is we are going to rotate our molecule so that we're drawing horizontal instead of vertical. So rotate your Fisher projection clockwise by 90 degrees. Then you are going to fold the horizontal chain into a hexagon and rotate the groups on carbon 5 um, such that carbon 6 is going to be projected upward above the ring. Okay, And then you are going to bond the oxygen on carbon 5 to carbon 1. So again, when we're drawing the Haworth projection, the carbon six group is going to be above the ring. The hydroxyl on group two will be below, and the hydroxyl groups on three and four will still stay above. So again, if you look at how it's drawn here, right, this is carbon two. See, it's below the straight line. So in the ring, it's going to be below. For carbons three and four, we're above the straight line. So it's going to be above the ring once we form the ring. As this guy rotates over, carbon six and the hydroxyl sort of flips spots so that carbon six is above and the hydroxyl is going to be in the third three o'clock hour position. Okay? All right, so I just want you to see why. The hydroxyls here are above and below. Again, if you were to straighten this out, you would see below, above, above. So when it comes into a ring, it's going to stay that way, below, above, above. Okay? <clears throat> now, once the oxygen has attacked that carbonyl carbon, remember we are going to reduce the carbonyl carbon oxygen bond on carbon one to a single bond and the hydrogen that was on this hydroxyl then moves over to this oxygen. Okay. Now when we create this cyclic molecule we can get either the alpha isomer or the beta isomer. Both are just as likely to happen. So you would draw both the alpha with the hydroxyl below and the beta with the hydroxyl above as probable products for this cyclization reaction. Okay, so both are possible. All right, so I want you to practice this now on your own with number six in our in-class activity. So go back and open that up and start number six. Pause, and when you're ready, come back. If you're struggling with this, go back to the example that I did with you and actually draw it out on paper, right? Do step one, do step two, do step three, okay? And then apply that to number six. Number six isn't going to quite have you draw it. You're just going to place the hydroxyls where they should be, either above or below the ring. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> 
So let's talk about reactions um, beyond the cyclicization. Um, so again, monosaccharides are more often going to form cyclic compounds as Hallworth compounds in solution. However, there's always a small amount of open chain form present. So we're really in an equilibrium between the open chain and the cyclic form as long as that anomeric or that hemiacetyl carbon isn't taken up in a glycosidic bond. Um, when, it, when it is in an open chain form, um, the open chain aldehyde can actually react with copper in order to create a red colored copper oxide product. And this is actually, you should recognize this, right? This is an oxidation reaction um, in which we are oxidizing the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid in order to produce an oxidized form of the sugar, which would then be called the gluconoic acid or whatever we started, right? If we start with glucose, we're going to end up with gluconoic acid. Again, we'll talk about how we name carboxylic acids in our next chapter. All right. When this reaction happens, we're starting with a blue colored solution. If we have what's called um, a reducing sugar, right? A sugar that has an open aldehyde or uh, to it, then we will end up with a red colored solution as the copper becomes reduced, right? So the sugar becomes oxidized and the copper molecule becomes reduced, right? We then call this a reducing sugar. So a carbohydrate such as the open change form of D-glucose that reduces another substance such as copper, we're reducing copper to get that red color, is going to be called a reducing sugar. So anything that will react with Benedict's solution will be considered a reducing sugar. And to be able to be a reducing sugar, we have to be able to form this open chain um, aldehyde. Now fructose typically cannot be oxidized, right? Because remember, we cannot oxidize ketones any further. There's no hydrogen coming off of this carbon to oxidize. However, sometimes we can get a rearrangement from the ketone to the aldose or going from fructose to glucose. If that happens, then we will react with Benedict's solution in order to reduce the copper and get a carboxylic acid out of our sugar. Okay, so sometimes you will see keto hexoses such as fructose react in Benedict's solution if that rearrangement occurs. <clears throat> now the reduction, right? So this is, these are all oxidation reactions in which we are oxidizing the sugar um, even though we reduce the copper, right? If one thing's oxidized, the other thing is reduced. Now conversely, when we reduce a monosaccharide, right? The reduction of a carbonyl group um, in a monosaccharide is going to produce an alcohol. So when we convert an aldehyde to an alcohol, the sugar becomes called an aldotol, right? An aldotol. Um, so for example, D-glucose, when we reduce its aldehyde, we will end up with the molecule D-sorbitol, okay? Again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize these names. I'm going to ask you to recognize what an aldotol is, right? It's an any aldose that gets reduced into an alcohol. But you don't have to specifically remember that the aldotol of D-glucose is D-sorbitol. I just want you to be able to recognize what the product will look like, right? So the aldehyl group becomes an alcohol. So for example, let's draw the product for the reduction of D-mannose. Um, so when we're reducing D-mannose, we're going to add dihydrogen over a platinum catalyst. And what that's going to do is that's going to take your carbonyl group and convert that to an alcohol. So we will end up with everything else the same. Notice we haven't changed any of the stereochemistry about any of these chiral carbons. The only thing we've changed is that C to double bond O is now going to be replaced with an alcohol. So we get CH2OH. All right, so why don't you practice that um, by answering question seven on the in-class activity. Pause, and when you're ready, come back. So let's talk about disaccharides now. 
So disaccharides are when we create what is called a glycosidic bond between the hemiacetyl carbon in the cyclic uh, monosaccharide and another hydroxyl. So remember, to form a full acetyl, typically this is not super stable, so it wants to react with another alcohol and to form the full acetyl. So a full acetyl molecule of two disaccharides is going to begin sort of what we consider our polymerization of monosaccharides into polysaccharides. If we have two of them, then it's just a disaccharide. That bond that is forming between the hemiacetyl hydroxyl and the hydroxyl of another saccharide is what's called a glycosidic bond. For example, the disaccharide of galactose and glucose is what makes the disaccharide lactose. And that reaction or that bond is described as a beta 1 4 glycosidic bond. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay? So, some other examples of disaccharides um, is if we have glucose and glucose react, we get maltose. If we have glucose and galactose, we already talked about that, that's lactose. And then glucose plus fructose gives us sucrose. These are sort of our most common dietary disaccharides that we run across. Um, in our everyday lives. So we can visually look at these. Um, again, notice all of these glycosidic linkages are occurring between carbon one of glucose, which is that hemiacetyl carbon, also known as the anomeric carbon by carbohydrate chemists, and a hydroxyl off of the second sugar. Um, for many of them, it might be carbon-4, um, but it's not always carbon-4. If you notice with sucrose, it's carbon-2, which also happens to be the anomeric carbon of fructose. And we'll talk about why this is special in a minute. Okay, so let's analyze what is happening here. All right, uh, let me go a step back and talk about the glycosidic bond. All right, when your glycosidic bond is occurring between carbon-1 and carbon-4, that's where the name 1,4 comes from in our glycosidic bond. So notice 1,4 represents that we have the bond between carbon-1 of the first sugar and carbon-4 of the second sugar. If carbon-1 is in the alpha position, meaning the hydroxyl is below the ring, then we would describe it as an alpha-1-4 glycosidic bond. It doesn't matter what the position of the second hydroxyl is um, in this case because they are not the anomeric carbon and it's just not how we are going to describe it. Right? So it's usually described by the first carbon or the anomeric carbon in the glycosidic bond. So again, alpha 1,4 is going to describe alpha because the hydroxyl off the anomeric carbon is in the alpha structure, 1 because we're talking about carbon 1, and then 4 because the second hydroxyl is reacting off of carbon 4 in the sugar. Okay. Again, if we look at lactose, lactose is described as a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond between two glucose and a galactose molecule. Again, beta because the hydroxyl off of galactose on its anomeric carbon is in the beta position, right? The upward position, um, one because we're talking about carbon one, and then um, four because it's reacting with carbon four on glucose. So it's a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond between galactose and glucose, okay? When we're talking about sucrose, here we're going to have an alpha 1,2 glycosidic bond, okay? Alpha 1,2. <clears throat> so let's practice analyzing this. 
Malibos is a disaccharide that's 30 times sweeter than sucrose. So the first question is, what are the monosaccharide units in Malibos? So here what you're going to do is look at each of these sugars and identify which monosaccharide does it represent. And this is just going to be comparing to a table in your textbook and thinking about the um, projections, right? Which sugar has hydroxyl below, up, up, and here, right? So hopefully you recognize that this is glucose, right? Because it's carbon two is below, carbons three and four are both in the upward position. Um, for this second sugar, right? Here we're talking about carbon six is the hydroxyl donating carbon. Again, notice here that carbon one, it's down, so that's just alpha. Um, but here, these are the ones that's going to help us identify what kind of sugar we are. So it's below, up, below. Okay, so go to the table and look that up. Now, what type of glycosidic bond is forming? Well, here, we know it's going to be a 1,6, right, because we can see that labeled. And because the oxygen is coming from below the ring in the glycosidic bond, that tells me that this is an alpha. So it's going to be alpha 1,6 glycosidic bond. Um, and so therefore the structure is going to be alpha um, in part C. All right, so it's 1,6 is our glycosidic bond and alpha, alpha 1,6. So hopefully you identified um, that the monosaccharide units in mellivose is galactose and glucose and that the bond is an alpha 1,6 glycosidic bond and that we are talking about alpha mellibose because it is an alpha 1,6 bond, not a beta 1,6 bond. All right, so now I want you to repeat that um, um, an analysis by answering number eight on our in-class activity. Pause, and when you're ready, come back. So now let's talk about polysaccharides. So polysaccharides are formed when many monosaccharides are joined together. So as long as you still have another anomeric carbon open, um, such as this one here in mellibose, or if we look at, say, maltose or even lactose, right, we have additional anomeric carbons open that could then react with another monosaccharide through the same glycosidic bond or a different glycosidic bond. So we can continue growing these chains beyond the disaccharide in order to form a trisaccharide or a polysaccharide um, and really, really long polymers as well. Sucrose, on the other hand, you notice both of the hemiacetyl carbons here are taken up in the same glycosidic bond. So there are no more hemiacetyl carbons to react with any incoming um, monosaccharides. So therefore, sucrose will only ever exist. We can't grow that into a longer polymer. What you'll also notice is because the anomeric or the hemiacetyl carbon is taken up in the bond, um, this is also considered a non-reducing sugar because there is no open aldehyde or ketone carbonyl to potentially react with Benedict's solution and change its color. All right. So this is an example of what we would call a non-reducing sugar. Again, because the hemiacetyl carbons for both these monosaccharides are taken up by the same glycosidic bond. All right, so coming back to our polysaccharides, as long as there is an open hemiacetyl carbon or anomeric carbon at the end of the disaccharide or growing polymer chain, we can continue adding. So one important example of a polymer of sugar is starch. Um, so this is the storage form of glucose in plants, um, often found as insoluble granules in rice, wheat, potatoes, beans, and cereals. Um, and it's actually composed of two different polysaccharides, amylose and amylopectin. Um, so amylose is unbranched, 
meaning it is just a long line of glucoses attached in alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkages, right? So 1,4, 1,4, 1,4. Again, alpha because the hydroxyl or the bond is coming from below the ring according to the one carbon. Amulose makes up at about 20% of starch, um, and it typically consists of 250 to 4,000 glucose units, um, all connected by those alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds in a continuous chain. And it often coils to kind of looks like a helix in its three-dimensional structure. Amulopectin, however, which comprises the other 80% of starch, can have branches. So instead of just the alpha-1,4, we can also get what's called an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond, where the hemiacetyl carbon on this end is going to form that glycosidic bond with the hydroxyl on carbon-6 of another chain on um, amulopectin. Um, so here you're going to get a lot of branching. Now glycogen is just like amulopectin. Um, however, this is what's stored in mammalian or animal cells. Um, and you still have mainly the alpha-1,4 chains with many alpha-1,6 branches. So if we look at glycogen compared to amulopectin, with glycogen we have a lot more branching than we do with amulopectin. So we actually get branching every 10 to 15 glucose units in glycogen um, versus maybe every 50 to 100 branches in amulopectin, okay? And cellulose um, is another major structural um, polymer. Um, with this one, instead of having alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds, now we get beta 1,4 glycosidic bonds. So here the hydroxyl is coming above the ring of the anomeric carbon um, instead of below the ring. And what that's going to cause is it's going to cause a very tight, tightly packed helical structure um, which is going to prevent um, hydrogen bonding with water, making it very insoluble in water. So it just gets packed a lot more compactly and it's going to hydrogen bond with itself and make it really insoluble. This is the major structural component of wood and plants. Um, and it has a rigid structure to the cell wall and it gives a rigid structure to cell walls in wood and fibers. Um, it's very resistant to hydrolysis um, compared to starches. And we do not have enzymes to break those beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds like we do for the alpha-1,6s. So um, we cannot break this down. And many animals that do eat woody, fibrous plants leverage bacteria in their gut to break those bonds and free up those glucose molecules for consumption. Um, so it's really the bacteria that break it down for animals like horses and cows um, that eat a lot of this fibrous plant material. All right, so again, we can just visually summarize these structures. Amulose, um, you're going to get a long straight chain, often forms sort of a loose coil through the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds of glucose. Amulopectin, we have that same alpha-1,4. Um, but then we also get branches with the alpha-1,6. Glycogen is very similar to amulopectin, but we get more branching. And then cellulose is a very tightly packed coiled structure through the beta-1,4 glycosidic bond as opposed to amulose with the alpha-1,6. All right, so quickly, um, what types of polysaccharides and types of glycosidic bonds are found in each of the following. So what's found in sort of um, very fibrous plants, right? Hopefully you recognize that it's cellulose with the beta-1,4 versus the starches found in potatoes, which is made of amulose and amulopectin. Both have um, alpha-1,4 and amulopectin has the alpha-1,6 branches, right? So cellulose, beta-1,4, uh, B starch, amulose, and amulopectin, both with alpha-1,4, and then amulopectin has those additional branches with the alpha-1,6. All right, so now I want you to go back to Mastering Chemistry, Chapter 15, and answer number 9.
Um, this should wrap us up for our lecture. Um, so pause, come back, and we'll summarize. All right, very good. So um, now that you finished the in-class activity, you're now ready to move on to your homework assignment. And just to review, um, in this chapter, we have talked about the different classifications of carbohydrates, so monosaccharides, which are the single sugar units, disaccharides, which include two sugar units, and then the longer polysaccharides, which have many. Um, examples of monosaccharides include glucose, galactose, and fructose, all of which are reducing sugars because we can open um, those rings, and as long as that anomeric carbon is able to open into the ring, we can reduce with Benedict's solution to give that red color. Um, we also talked about how carbohydrates are chiral compounds, which have mirror images that are not superimposable, and we can draw them as Fisher projections in their straight chains or as Hallworth structures in the cyclic chain or the cyclic structures. Um, for disaccharides, we have maltose and lactose. Both of those still have that open anomeric carbon at their end, so they're considered reducing. However, remember sucrose, the anomeric carbon is taken up, both anomeric carbons are taken up in the glycosidic bond, so it's non-reductive. And then for polysaccharides, we focused on polymers of glucose. In plants, we have amulose, amulopectin, and cellulose. And in animals, we have glycogen. Remember, glycogen and amulopectin are very similar, um, but we have more branching. Cellulose is unique because of all of them, it's the only one with beta glycosidic bonds. All right. Um, so again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to write them down, email me, come to the Zoom session, um, or bring them with you the next time we meet in class. And I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.